Hello there, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. Now, if you look at the latest generation of Android flagship smartphones, for example, the Galaxy S7, the LG G5, the Google Pixel, they all come with four gigabytes of RAM. And if you look at the equivalent in the iPhone lineup, the iPhone 7 has two gigabytes of RAM and the iPhone 7S has three gigabytes of RAM. In fact, three gigabytes is the most that Apple have ever put into one of their iPhones. And if you go back to last year and the year before that, you will see this trend that Android phones always seem to have more memory than iPhones. And this has led some people to say that's because Android uses more memory than iOS and therefore Android phones need to have more RAM inside of them. Well, is that true? Let me explain. So first of all, let's just clear up one thing here. We're talking about random access memory here, RAM. Okay, that's the four gigabytes. Maybe last year it was three gigabytes. We're not talking about internal storage, which might be 16 gigabytes or 32 gigabytes or even 64 gigabytes, which sometimes gets called memory because it uses what they call flash memory. So therefore people mix it up. So we're talking about RAM here, random access memory, not talking about internal storage. So the RAM is used by the CPU to hold the operating system itself, both iOS and Android sit in RAM, and the data associated with running that operating system. And then the apps that you run also stay in the RAM while they're running and the data that those apps need. And you need enough RAM to hold the operating system and to hold your app. So then you might ask yourself the question, well, how much free RAM is there on my smartphone? Now, unfortunately, the term free RAM is not actually very, very useful. And that's because OS designers worked out that actually when you have a block of RAM that's empty, there's nothing in it, it's not being used at all, that's not very efficient. For example, if you want to have lots of I.O., lots of read and writes from your flash disk, it would be better if that reading and writing was cached. That would improve performance. So if you've got empty RAM, well, that RAM could be given over to using for caching. And it's really good because actually in a moment, if you need to run another app and it needs more RAM, you can say, okay, let's abandon the caching. It doesn't matter. What's more important now is this app. So it's not actually free RAM in the sense it's not being occupied. If you ask both iOS and Android how much free RAM they've got, they're a tiny little bit. They're like two megabytes or eight megabytes or something, tiny, tiny bit. But we have to use the term available RAM. That's RAM that could be repurposed in a moment, in an instant, to loading up an app or to giving data space to an app. Now that's something quite different. Now for my testing, I'm going to be using an iPhone 7 and a Nexus 5X. And the reason for that is the iPhone 7 has two gigabytes of RAM and runs the latest operating system from Apple. And the Nexus 5X has two gigabytes of RAM and runs the latest version of Android. Now, when you boot up the Nexus 5X, it has around about 840 megabytes of available RAM when it boots up, not free RAM, but available RAM when it boots up. And when you boot up the iPhone 7, it has around 740 megabytes of available RAM. So we can see actually from the beginning that actually Android uses less RAM in a freshly booted system than iOS does. So that's our first fact here that actually in a freshly booted system, the Nexus 5X and the iPhone 7, the iPhone 7 uses more RAM than the Android phone. So when the devices boot, there's no principal apps running. There might be some background services running, let's say checking your email, but there's no actual apps running. You haven't touched anything on the screen to say, I want to run a particular app. Now, when you do tap on an icon to launch an app, it gets read in from the flash drive into the RAM, and it also will start asking for some memory to do the things that it wants to do. And when that happens, the amount of available RAM decreases because some of it has been given over to the new app. Now, all modern day uh, operating systems, including on the desktop and mobile phones, use a thing called virtual memory. Now, I haven't done a video about virtual memory. If you want to see one, then please do tell me in the comments. But just to tell you quickly, basically each app thinks it's running in its own address space, a virtual address space, and it doesn't know about the other apps. And the operating system, its job is to allocate physical RAM related to what the app wants in its virtual world, its virtual address space. Now that means actually it can be quite complicated because an app might ask for something, might say, hey, I want a megabyte of RAM because I'm about to load a picture from the flash disk, but the operating system might not actually give it to it at that very moment. It will wait because there'll be some more time will go past and 
the app will start to actually load the data from the hard drive, from the flash disk, and then it will actually start to write it to the RAM. At that point, the operating system will say, okay, you can now actually have some physical RAM. So an app might ask for something, but it doesn't actually get it until it actually starts to write to it. And actually what you might find is the operating system might not even give it a whole one megabyte of RAM. If it only writes to half of that area of memory, it might only physically allocate it half of that amount of memory. And that's the difference between virtual addressing and physical addressing. And so therefore there's a difference between how much RAM an app has asked for in its virtual address space and how much it's actually using inside of the physical RAM. And that's known as the resident set size or maybe the real physical memory usage. Now, you can actually, on both the Android Studio and on Xcode, you can actually bring up some tools which will show you how much physical RAM is being used by each particular app. And so what I've done is I've launched some various apps on both the iPhone 7 and the Nexus 5X using the tools from the development chains to study to see how much space is being given over in physical RAM to each of the different apps. And I've taken a, a variety of apps. I've got like things like Crossy Road and uh, Temple Run 2 and Microsoft Word and the YouTube app. And I've run all of them to see how much space they occupy. And the question before us is, does Android use more RAM than iOS? Well, here are the results. Let's have a look. So the results are a bit of a mixed bag. If we look at Crossy Road, for example, the Android version, resident in physical RAM is 383 megabytes and in iOS it's 308 megabytes, obviously a bit more used there by, by Android. But if you look at Temple Run, in Android it only uses 211 megabytes, whereas on iOS it uses 364 megabytes. And then Subway Surfers, Star Wars Fort Arena, they're pretty close, particularly Star Wars Fort Arena, only just a couple of megabytes in it there. If you look at YouTube, that seems to use what, double in that case on Android, Facebook up to the login prompts about the same, Microsoft Word a bit bigger on Android. And in fact, if you add up all those numbers and draw an average, an Android phone uses around 6% more than an iOS device for the same range of programs. So there is a slight memory increase on Android, that cannot be denied, but it's certainly not double, <laughs> you know, or you know, or like just just a huge difference. We are talking about the same actual relative size. And that's actually, if you think about it, that's gonna be true, isn't it? Because if you're loading up a game like Crossy Road, it's got lots of graphics in it. It's got lots of uh, animations going on. Those graphics and animations are gonna take the same amount of space on an Android phone as they do on an iOS phone. So really the idea that Android uses load more memory, uh, you know, so that you need an extra gigabyte or something because of that actually isn't true at all. There's just actually no truth to that argument whatsoever. And the other thing to notice here is that even games, relatively complex games like Star Wars Force Arena or Temple Run 2, they're using 300, 400 megabytes of RAM. They're certainly not using four gigabytes or three gigabytes even that you get in the iPhone 7S. So this really isn't the reason why there is extra RAM inside of these devices. It has actually very little to do with the actual running app. Now, I'm sure there are some bigger apps up there. I'm sure you can download some of these one gigabyte, one and a half gigabyte downloads that you can get. I'm sure they are gonna use more space, but that isn't actually the problem here because you can see that Temple Run and Star Wars Force Arena and Crossroad can all run very comfortably in that for 700 or 800 megabytes of available RAM that there are on the two gigabyte version of the Nexus 5X and the two gigabyte uh, iPhone 7. So why the extra RAM? Well, there's more to this story. Now, we're all very used to using our phones in a multitasking fashion. I might be using Gmail, I might be checking some emails, replying to it, and then I might switch to a game to play Crossy Road for a few minutes. Then I might switch to my music app to start listening to some music. And then a notification comes in and I might go back to Gmail. Now, we, what do we expect to happen? This is really the question, it's about user experience. For sure, if I go back to Gmail, and I use Gmail lots of times during the day, I want it to be exactly as it was when I uh, last used it. But if I play Crossy Road and then switch out of it, and then I, I don't go back to it for a week, because I've suddenly now a different game becomes my game of preference, or I just haven't had any free time to do uh, any gaming at all, what do I expect Crossy Road to be when I come back after a week? Do I expect it to be exactly where I left it? Do I mind if it restarts from the beginning? What do I expect? Well, as I said, this is about user experience. Now, when you 
are in an app. It's called the foreground app. It's the app that you're interacting with. It's the app that's displaying on the screen. But the moment you switch away to another app, that app moves from the foreground into the background. Now, how those background apps are treated is where we find the interesting part of this story. Now, as I said, there's only a certain amount of available RAM. So when I start an app, if I then start a second one, is there still enough available RAM for both of them to be in RAM at the same time? If I start a third app, is there still fourth app? Is there still space? That's the question that's, that has these operating systems have to cope with. Now, on a desktop, what happens is when it runs out of memory, when there's no more physical RAM, it uses a process known as swapping. And swapping basically means it takes the bits that it doesn't need anymore because you actually haven't used that app for a week and it copies it to the hard drive, not the app like the program that you install, but all the memory that's using, it just gets shifted out onto the hard disk, that RAM becomes freed up, and then the new app can go in there. And then after a week, if you do eventually switch back to that app, well, actually it can take it back from the hard drive, find some more free RAM, which probably happens again through some more swapping, and then it puts it back into memory and you can carry on running it. Now, you can't do that on smartphones for lots of different reasons. One is that writing to flash is actually quite slow. The second is that actually you can wear out the flash because of all this constant reading and writing to it. So iOS and Android don't take that approach of swapping out to flash disk, which is what you would get on a, on a laptop or a, or a desktop. Instead, they have to do something different. Now, what actually happens is, is that on Android, it will keep trying to load apps into the uh, into the available RAM and then if it hasn't got any more available RAM it will try to use a thing called compressed swap. Now compressed swap isn't like traditional swapping where it swaps to the hard drive or to an internal storage. What it does is it takes the pages of RAM, the blocks of RAM and says well if I compress these like like zip compression if I compress these and then put them into some RAM hey I've actually managed to free up 50% of the occupied RAM of, that that app was using or, or maybe even more and now I can use that RAM to actually put in my uh, put in the new app. So it uses this idea of swapping but not to external storage or internal storage, it swaps to its own RAM, but compressed. Now, if it can't free up enough RAM by using the compression technique, then Android says, well, I'm gonna to have to delete an app here from memory. And it's got various algorithms that it uses. And let's say I haven't played Crossy Road for a week, but it was still in memory. Basically, Android will say, well, he hasn't used that for a week. It will send a message to Crossy Road and say, you're about to get deleted. Please save any state information that you want to save. Crossy Road gets a, a short amount of time to, to save where it, where it is, and then basically Android just kills it. Psh, you're gone. It just deletes it from memory, removes it completely. And that space that was used up by that app is now used for the new app that you just touched on, tapped on to, to load up. Now, I did an experiment on the Nexus 5X. If I ran, for example, Crossy Road, it would use a certain amount of space. I could then maybe run Temple Run 2, and that would run a certain amount of space. And both apps could stay in memory simultaneously, and I could switch between them, and exactly where I left off, I could carry on running, I could carry on fighting, I could carry on doing everything I was doing inside uh, those apps. But if I tried to run a third app, let's say Star Wars Force Arena, then at that point, there wasn't enough free RAM, and it couldn't get enough RAM using the compressed swapping. So at that point, one of the apps is killed off by Android to make space for the new app. And if I then switch back to, let's say, Crossy Road, which was, if that was one that was deleted, if I don't switch back to Crossy Road, it starts again, you get the hipster whale thing coming up and it reloads from the beginning because it was kicked out uh, of, of the memory. So on the Nexus 5X with two gigabytes of RAM, I found I could run two games simultaneously switch between them, games that occupy two, three, four hundred megabytes of RAM, and then if a third one came along, that would cause an app to be killed, and that's using the low memory killer. That's the system that you find inside of Android. When it hasn't enough memory, it decides which apps to push out of the main memory. And so that's a disadvantage of two gigabytes of RAM. When you're running multiple apps that have large memory requirements, 300, 400, 500 megabytes, then at some point other apps have to be killed off to make space for the new app that you're running. That's why if you've got a three gigabyte phone or a four gigabyte phone, actually the swapping between the apps, the multitasking where you switch from one app to another becomes seamless because they're all held in memory at the same time. Now what about iOS? 
it has exactly the same problems. And I, in my testing, I've seen iOS kill off apps in exactly the same way that Android does. And you, you go back to them and you tap on them again and they aren't there in memory. They actually are, have to reload from the beginning. And I verified that using the tools that you get with Xcode. So and, uh, iOS also kills off apps where it doesn't have enough uh, memory. However, this mean streak of Android, you find less often in iOS because iOS manages to reduce the resident set size of programs that are already running to much lower levels. For example, we saw that Crossy Road might be using 300 something megabytes of RAM, but actually once it switches to the background, I have seen iOS whittle that 300 megabytes down to 100 megabytes, and then if you put more pressure on the system, I've seen that whittle down to under 10 megabytes. But yet when you switch to it, it's able to instantly run from where it was before and the program carries on running. It doesn't reload, you are switching to it. Now how iOS is doing that, we don't know. Apple doesn't give away the details of the internals of its system. It could be using a clever paging system where, for example, the code that's running and the graphics that are running are automatically uh, taken out of the memory because it knows, iOS knows, it can find them on the hard disk again at a relevant time. And when you switch to it, it just brings all those back in. Now, when you do switch to it, it its resident set size grows big again, it instantly. It goes back up to 100, 150, 200 megabytes in a, in a flash, in a, in, a, in, a, in a moment. So that data is still there. It's probably getting it from the, uh, from the internal storage. It could be using compression because that's now found in Mac OS, OS 10 since 10.9, I think. So that compression idea exists in, uh, in Apple's thinking. It could be doing that. We don't know. But I will say, I'm not an Apple fan, but I will say I'm impressed by how iOS handles low memory situations for background apps. So the reason why Apple have been putting less RAM inside of their phones is not because iOS needs less memory, it needs exactly the same memory as, as Android does. But when it's in this background situation, it's able to reduce the resident set size, the physical RAM needed by background apps that are not running, they've just been switched away from, significantly. Now obviously where this falls apart is, for example, if you're using an iPad and you're using the split screen uh, idea, the split window, then these two uh, apps running simultaneously both need memory and they need it now and that will cause the, the system to run out of memory much quicker. However, I must say that the iOS handles low memory situations better than uh, the Android does. And so what this means is that basically Apple have said, well, we're not going to put an extra gigabyte of RAM, we're not going to put an extra two gigabyte of RAM, we're going to rely on this technology that handles background tasks, whereas Android vendors have said basically we're going to stick another gigabyte of RAM. Now, both are valid solutions. Both are solutions to this problem. Maybe one is more elegant than the other, maybe the other is more advantageous to the consumer, that depending on your point of view, but they are both solutions to the same problem. What do you do when you don't have enough RAM and Android has dealt with it in one way and iOS has dealt with it in another way. And that's fundamentally the difference between iOS and Android and its RAM usage. Well, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. I hope you enjoyed this video. Just a quick thing. This is not a flame war. I appreciate what Android's doing. I appreciate what iOS is doing. I appreciate personally having more RAM in my Android phone because it's useful for that switching. I also appreciate how iOS is handling that low RAM situation. Please, let's talk about the technology. Let's congratulate Android. Let's congratulate Apple for the way they're handling this very complicated task of running multiple apps at the same time and then being there when we tap on them in an instant. It's a very hard problem in software engineering to solve. They've solved it in two different ways, not a flame war. Let's just concentrate on the technology here. Now, if you did enjoy this video, please do give it a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Android Authority's YouTube channel. You should download our Android Authority app because that will give you access to all of our news and features directly on your mobile phone. But last but not least, don't forget to go over to androidauthority.com because we are your source for all things Android.